By the end of the American Civil War, corporations, not plantation owners, relied the most on slave labor. Southern railroads alone owned an estimated 20,000 slaves. The Emancipation Proclamation effectively freed the slaves, but did not eliminate the Southern economy's need for forced black labor. Convict leasing was the white solution to the loss of slave labor. Black codes were enacted in many states to reinforce racial hierarchies and white rule. Blacks were arrested, fined, and assaulted for such trivial charges as vagrancy, drunkenness, and those were the lucky ones. For those even suspected of violent crimes, particularly the rape of a white woman, those were almost always lynched, stabbed, burned, and or mutilated. Lynchings and race riots where white mobs would descend upon the black section of town and kill, beat, or shoot any black they saw were common in the post-Civil War period. In the Tulsa riot of 1921, whites burned down Black Wall Street and almost succeeded in pushing blacks entirely out of town. Lynchings and race riots were violent means that both worked towards the single goal, the maintenance of racial hierarchy in American society. Prisons have worked in many ways as racialized institutions that were designed and still work as a system intent upon upholding racial caste hierarchies. Historically, blacks have been the overwhelming majority of the prison population, even though they commit relatively less crimes than whites. Today, America locks up a quarter of the world's prisoners, despite only having around 4% of the world's population. These numbers have nothing to do with crime, statistics, and have everything to do with policing and policy laws that were enacted specifically to target minority urban male populations. In this channel, we will be discussing the growth of the prison industrial complex and the history of race and crime in American society. Today, we will discuss Parchment Farm, Mississippi, now known as Mississippi State Penitentiary. This special report will be the first one of our series, and we hope there will be many more to come. Let's now discuss the history of Parchment Farm. On December 17, 1900, the Clarion Ledger reported on the new convict farm being established on a large tract of land formerly owned by the Parchment family. The Mississippi Penitentiary Board of Control had purchased 13,000 acres of land in fertile Sunflower County along the Yazoo Delta Railway. The following year, the state prisoners were moved to Parchment in order to prepare the area for farming. James K. Vardaman, elected governor in 1903, became known as the White Chief of Parchment. Vardaman was a populist and virulent racist, and Parchment fit neatly into his platform. He opposed convict leasing because it benefited big business operators, and not the poor rural whites who had voted for him. Vardaman argued that convict leasing allowed corporations to replace free white laborers with convicts who were predominantly black. Free and forced black laborers were utilized as strike breakers and as cheap alternatives to unionized free white laborers. Convicts did not go on strike, they could be worked to the brink of death, and if indeed death did occur, as it so often did, another prisoner could easily be purchased. Slaves had value to their owner due to the fact that it was expensive to replace a slave, especially a productive one. Convicts were cheap, and they could easily be replaced. In his 1905 governor's address, Vardaman stoked white hysteria about the criminal tendency of the Negro. He believed that penal reform was the best way to civilize blacks. Vardaman's beliefs embodied the southern white supremacist myth of black inferiority and white benevolent masters. Vardaman's belief in white supremacy was absolute, and he saw parchment as the best way to eliminate convict leasing and to reinvent the southern paternal plantation system under the new guise of penal reform. I want the Negro protected in the enjoyment of life, liberty, and the product of his labor and the pursuit of his happiness, Vardaman said. And the only way to do it is to enforce vigorously the law against the vagrants. Laws against vagrancy was a primary method of imprisoning unemployed blacks. The Vagrancy Act enforced harsh fines on any black who could not provide proof of employment to white authority figures. Any black who could not provide proof of employment would be fined, and those who could not pay the fine would be sent to jail. 
or had their fines paid for by some white landowner who then would be leasing the prisoner until he paid off the fee of the fine. Most were worked long past the time it took them to pay off their debts, and many were worked to death. Mrs. Jane Childs wrote begging for information on her son Walter. She explains how he wrote to me that he would be out this time in May and he would come home, but she had not heard from him since. In 1915, convict leasing had been eliminated in all states with the exception of Alabama and Florida. In Alabama, convict leasing was synonymous with coal. The number of prisoners rose and shrunk with the demands of the coal companies, with the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company being the largest purchaser of convict laborers. Companies like Slosh and Sheffield, Pratt Consolidated, and Red Feather Coal Company all relied upon forced prison laborers. As Oshinsky describes, when times were tight, local police would sweep the streets for vagrants, drunks, and thieves. Many would be sentenced with misdemeanor crimes and sent off to the coal mines, and in the case of Mississippi, to Parchment Farm. 97% of Alabama convicts were prior to 1950 black. At Parchment Farm, 91% were black in 1905. Corporations, particularly those in the South, relied upon forced black labor, and in many ways so did American capitalism. Blacks mined the coal, worked the iron forges, picked the cotton, and built many southern railroads. In Mississippi, Parchment, with the ardent support of Vardaman, quickly became very profitable. By the end of its second full year of operation, the new penitentiary had earned $185,000 for the state, roughly $5 million in today's dollars, generated mainly by the many farm camps scattered across the plantation. Parchment was set up like the paternalist plantation system it sought so desperately to emulate. Blacks were worked from sunup to sundown. These workdays could run 15 hours long and 100 degrees hot. Though the inmates suffered from exhaustion, heat stroke, illness, and injury, the prison kept running. A leather whip, known as Black Annie, was used liberally on inmates. Corporal punishment was administered by and according to the whims of the trustees. Those trustees were armed inmates drawn from the ranks of Parchment's most violent offenders, empowered by prison officials to brutally maintain order. In the decades that followed, inmates grew peas, oats, corn, and potatoes. They raised hogs and cattle. They planted cotton, picked cotton, and ginned cotton. The women's camp stitched the cotton into clothes, including those worn by inmates. Parchment today grows crops to feed the inmates and also for corporations like Idaho Potatoes. Parchment would be one of the first prisons in which convicts were given conjugal visits and allowed to sleep with prostitutes. Many inmates argued that this greatly increased productivity, which might have been a big reason for why it was acceptable. Prisoners were segregated by race and gender, although there were a few white male prisoners here and there, all female prisoners were black. Many white women who committed crimes, even murder, did not go to jail. Only in extremely rare cases were white women sent to prison prior to the Second World War. Parchment took so much from so many, and yet through all the pain and injustice, its greatest contribution came in the form of culture. The most famous example of the cultural innovations that came out of Parchment was the Parchment Farm Blues, sung by Buka White and later Parchment Farm by Moisey Allison. These songs were known as the Delta Blues, a musical tradition performed historically by the southern black slaves. Alan Lomax recorded the songs of prisoners working the fields of parchment. These songs are meant to uplift the soul and provide some sense of unity and freedom. Buka White, while serving time at parchment, rarely if ever worked in the fields. Instead, he performed for inmates and the prison staff. The legacy of parchment will forever be embroidered within the Mississippi State Penitentiary that now sits on the very same site that parchment once stood. Many still refer to it as the farm.